But communism was far from the only form of socialism to flourish after the war. In Western Europe and a few other places, a competing version was making new gains. It was called democratic socialism, or more often, social democracy. Its adherents were convinced that the true, humane, and democratic essence of socialism could still be reclaimed from imposters like fascism and communism. At the forefront of the movement was Britain's Labour Party, which challenged Winston Churchill in the first general election after Germany's surrender. We have shown that we can organize the resources of the country to win the war. We can do the same in peace. As Britain went to the polls, socialism's greatest hopes rode on the shoulders of Labour's unassuming leader, Clement Attlee. Clement Attlee began life as the painfully shy son of a prominent London solicitor. The Attlees had a vacation home and five full-time servants. They were devout Christians and active in volunteer work. The first thing you need to understand about Clement Attlee is that he came to socialism despite himself. It wasn't where he wanted to be, it wasn't what he was brought up to be. Uh, he had the fairly automatic conservative opinions of a man of his class at that time. Attlee graduated from Oxford and drifted into law. Then, one fall evening, his brother invited him to visit a club for disadvantaged boys in the notorious slums of East London's Limehouse district. For the first time, he saw the conditions that the poor lived in in England, that it changed his life. He saw children starving. He saw uh, huge families crammed into tiny, squalid little rooms with, with no furniture and no food and no heating. He saw the utter misery in which the poor lived and compared that to the way he had been brought up. This made him a socialist. Within a year and a half, the 24-year-old Attlee took over his club manor and moved in. The Limehouse district would remain his home for the next 14 years. In 1908, he joined a group of socialists within Britain's Labour Party. Atlee believed that if people lived in slum houses, if they were sick and couldn't have proper medical care, they grew up to be different people from those who lived in prosperity. The canon of socialism is you have to change the physical environment if you want to improve human nature, and that Atlee certainly believed. Atlee volunteered for combat during World War I and fought with extraordinary courage. As the government mobilized the economy for war, he and others saw it as evidence that socialism could work. The influence of socialists within the Labour Party was growing. In 1918, they revised the party's constitution to support common ownership. The British Labour Party was not started as a socialist party. It was started as a Labour Party, as a way for the Labour unions to get some more clout or representation in politics. It then attracted more and more kind of middle-class intellectuals who were socialists. And uh, in 1918, to make the middle-class socialists happy, the party adopts a platform which explicitly embraces socialism as the party's ideology. And where it does so is in this section that's called Clause 4, which basically said what we believe in is a society in which all the productive power is owned socially, meaning by the government or by the community. Attlee rose to become the Labour Party's leader. During World War II, he was second only to Winston Churchill in Britain's national unity government. When a peace was finally won, much of Britain lay in ruins. In June 1945, the country held its first general election in nearly a decade. The choice was between Winston Churchill 
and Clement Attlee, two men who had joined together to fight the Germans, but now had different visions of how to rebuild Britain. Any British family, including the most devoted Labour family, if they'd been asked who they wanted round for supper, they would have chosen Winston Churchill rather than Clement Attlee any day. But Winston Churchill seems to stand for the old ways, for unemployment, for poverty, for no medical care, for an adequate system of education. Attlee was a very much more withdrawn figure, very quietly spoken little man, with very little personal charisma. But what he stood for was what appealed to the British people. By noon on July 26th, the results were becoming clear. Labour had won by a landslide. And never before have the electors have shown clearly their desire that there should be in this country a Labour government carrying out Labour's full policy. Socialism had never before won so clear a mandate. The election was really fought on one issue, the welfare state. Uh, Attlee had a vision of a new Jerusalem, of a welfare state, of a city on a hill, of a society that would provide comprehensive national insurance. So this is a radical, reforming government which intends to transform British society. Alongside the social welfare system, the other cornerstone of Attlee's new policy was nationalization. Clause 4 was still enshrined in the party's constitution. Attlee now had his chance to bring common ownership to Britain. Let's go forward into this fight in the spirit of William Blake. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall the sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Attlee had published a book called The Labour Party in Perspective in the 1930s, but he reissued it when he was Prime Minister and uh, with an introduction that, that re-endorsed the same points. And it called for complete socialism. And he went on to say that he wanted all large industry nationalized and that small industry could remain in private hands for a time. But his ultimate vision was a completely socialized economy. Attlee's government would remain in power for six years. Before it left office in 1951, it had nationalized much of the country's industry and introduced an array of social welfare programs. They took into public ownership coal, rail, steel, road haulage, gas and electricity. They created a national health service, free medical care for everybody. They instituted a system of pension by rights at a level which made old age dignified, if not prosperous. I mean, they had a pretty busy six years. I don't think any government's ever been as busy.